go there. I'm going to talk for just a few minutes, hopefully, about unit testing, most specifically. Testing in general, but I'm going to kind of hone in on unit testing specifically. And that's what I'm going to do. So I'll just get to it. A lot of people have confusion about testing in general and unit testing. And I think one of the main issues with that is that, first of all, is separate what's a unit test, what's an integration test, and what the higher level tests are, like user acceptance tests and things like that. And one of the most common mistakes that I see with it is that a lot of people consider integration testing to be part of unit testing. And that's understandable because integration tests are very similar and have probably more overlap than differences with unit testing. So I don't consider that a crime, but if we can split those two ideas, especially those two ideas apart, then things can start to make a lot more sense and we can really get into the groove and feel more productive about writing tests and not let tests become this gigantic obstacle because they're supposed to be an enabler. They're supposed to enable us to write robust code, readable code, very efficiently, and, and to just increase all the positives about development. But number one, they're, they're to provide confidence. So what I have right here is this is the test-driven development, TDD you're probably familiar with. It's the red-green refactor loop. I'm not going to be focusing on test-driven development. I'm going to focus, like I said, towards unit testing, but I just wanted to mention this. The idea with test-driven development is you write the test first, literally. So you write a failing test, which would be like if you had a Hello World program, you would write a test that you maybe test for that output, and which that in and of itself would be a little bit of a violation of a unit test. But anyway, I'll get to that as we towards the end, but what you do is you write the failing test first, so we would test for the presence of the word hello world or whatever, the terminal, and then that test, of course, would fail immediately as soon as we tested for that output because there's nothing going on that does that until we write our program. So then green, to make it pass, we would write something that returned hello world. And then we'd refactor that if necessary, clean up the code, do whatever, you know, the once over, and then run that test again. So there actually is sort of a little implicit loop right here of every time you refactor, you want to go ahead and run your test again. So then for the next feature, which features a little bit too broad of a term, but for the next like micro feature, right? Our own little internal as a programmer feature, not, um, not like a business logic feature necessarily. We do the same thing, write a failing test, make a pass, refactor as necessary ad infinum okay so that's the generic test driven development which involves unit testing and it can also involve higher level testing and testing next is confidence and the reason confidence is so important is because that's why we test that is the one and only reason that we test it's just like if you think of not using automated test-driven unit testing, anything like that, you're going to be manually, physically testing your program, right? You're going to write your little Hello World program. Then you're going to jump over to your terminal, compile, and run it, and make sure it displays Hello World and all that fancy stuff, right? So that gives us confidence that that works. And then we might add a feature that says you can add your name as input. And then we want to make sure that it shows, the like, say, just a one up it it prints your name in reverse and says hello whoever's name in reverse right so then you jump back over to the terminal and check that it did that and it's like oh i forgot to put a space in between the first and last name i reversed them i forgot to include that space and you know you start noticing these little things so i better fix that and everything and and then you can just imagine how the program could potentially grow this is of course representative of this toy program i'm discussing is ideally representative of potentially much larger and more real world application. But anyway, that's to say that no matter what we are doing test driven, we're either doing it very inefficiently like that, 
or we're going to automate our tests and do it very much more efficiently. And one of the problems, of course, with manual testing that probably seems obvious, or maybe not, like some of the stuff that should seem obvious, is that we have a tendency, once we're done checking that the name worked right and everything, and then we move on to the next little thing to implement and test, we're not too excited about going back and testing that. Hey, it worked. What? But as our program grows, if we're not perfect about architectural considerations, then it's very easy for something to potentially bust that old behavior and break it. So one of the good thing with the automated tests, unit test, test development, all that, sorry, I'll try and quit repeating that, but I just want to really drive that home is that those tests, of course, are there. We write them, we pretty much write them once and we run them automatically over and over and over again. So that makes that confidence persist. So we can always be confident that everything we've written a test for will work until it breaks and then our test will tell us, hey, that broke. And that's one of the positives about test-driven development is because by writing that failing test first, you ensure that the test actually breaks. Because if you go back and write the test second, write tests afterwards, um, then there's this tendency to, you don't really know if the test is going to fail when it, right? And you don't want to write a test to test the test. That's just, that's out of hand. So with some edge cases that you go back and write later on and everything, um, you may have to do that. Or you can write a test that's supposed to fail well as an additional test that you add to verify that something does fail as expected. Otherwise, you're going to have to resort to some type of mutation in your code where you have to manually or automatically go and, uh, kind of break the code on purpose just to make sure that that test actually does break. But anyway, with the confidence, all of these things you see here listed, I stole a lot of these slides, by the way, so I hope that that's, that's considered a form of flattery. I'm not trying to take credit for any of this. This slide and a few others in particular were made by the gentleman that created the Cucumber framework. So I just sort of grabbed this confidence thing and then typed in these other things talking about around it and everything. So anyway, securities, these are all different layers, right? You have your security, your user interface, platform diversity, like whether or not it runs on multiple platforms, multiple versions of different software, all that. Your business logic, which some people confuse that with, oh, that's what unit tests do. They test the business logic. Yeah and no. They they can test business logic, but there will probably be the fewest unit tests around business logic per se, and most of them are just programmer tests. They're just testing your own code as you see fit, regardless of whether or not that's technically specific business calculation. If you can test those business calculations, if your program's low level enough and everything that you can test those calculations um, within unit tests, that's fine. But don't think that you're expected to test any and all business logic as a unit. That that may end up in uh, integrate, especially with microservices and stuff. A lot of that's probably going to be integration tests. Those are the real world business tests right there. Integration between systems and services. So that's exactly what integration tests are: is your integration into other systems and other services. So other processes. So anything you're sharing memory with at runtime when your program's running, that's a pretty good example of that's not an integration. If you're within that same process container, then that would be most likely a test. And of course, there's also performance testing. Performance testing is can go at all levels, but most likely that's going to involve more of the full stack. So anyway, most of this stuff right here is not necessarily a unit test. Unit tests work on the smaller components here. I stole this slide from a blog, but I, I wanted to include the link to the blog and everything, but they just, 90% of it was spot on, I felt like, but that 10%, I just, I couldn't myself to recommend it because I don't like leading astray on it. Anyway, full disclosure. So, with the unit testing you're testing, if you think of a circuit board, you're testing each one of these little tiny components. That's what the word units sort of an abstract term, right? It, 
it can vary in definition, and I think rightfully so. So we're wanting to test all these parts in isolation. You know, you put this multimeter on and see if the capacitor's acting properly, if that multimeter's capable of testing it or whatever. And um, I guess all of these are capacitors. But anyway, if it was a res oh, there's a little resistor. So if it's a resistor, you want to test its resistance and everything. And then you know once you go to pit that component, regardless of the arrangement of the components, you know that component was working the last time it was tested. So then if you get a failure, you can be pretty confident that your components, you know, you don't have a burned out resistor or anything. Most likely, you just have a, uh, it's the way that you've integrated those components that will be causing the problem at that point. And realistically, what we're doing with unit tests is we're constantly doing all the tests in isolation. So if you picture pitting that multimeter on each resistor, capacitor, whatever, individually at light speed, ideally and then after all those little individual components pass then immediately go and run integration tests and then turn around and run like a user acceptance test where that would be actual outside maybe of that contraption like that was a DVD player or something then you'd want to make sure okay eject works we put the DVD in the drive yeah the menu pops up and we play like so if you can see those different layers of testing there and of course, if you think about it, even there's even uh, components within these components here, you know, and you can see there's common components like these legs, common components um, inside. There's particular materials which were most likely tested at a factory before we even received those components. So maybe you might think of frameworks or your core language library or whatever, you know just even your computer system itself, whatever, those are all those things that you kind of expect to be tested by somebody else. But we're implicitly implicitly testing them as well when we run our own tests, because if we get, if we're testing in isolation, doing simple quick tests, and they fail and there's no apparent reason, then maybe it's a sign of something else. But that's pretty rare. But anyway, on. So with regards to uh, just general usability, not necessarily testing itself, the ideal UI response time, this is from a book, the guy who wrote Cucumber recommended on his talk that I originally stole a slide for this, but I just remade the slide, consolidated one. But anyway, it's a book on usability testing that he was referring to. And the ideal response time to click on something, you know, would be like, uh, under 100 milliseconds. So if it's under 100 milliseconds, then it feels like that was a quick enough response time. And we don't start to get much frustration usually with that. If it's one or more seconds, then our mind will start to wander typically. And if it's over 10 seconds, you know, if you're trying to load a web page that takes over 10 seconds, the user will typically leave. So obviously, like especially the idea here is that to say that we want to keep things in the sub-second range, fraction of a second, ideal. And if we want to do a big basket of things before people start getting a little bit weird and um, wanting to wander off, then we really need to cut down. So, so unit tests should be even less than 100 milliseconds apiece. We want to try and run um, tens or hundreds of unit tests in 100 milliseconds, ideal. And on a modern computer, you're with small, fast tests. That's pretty much what you're doing with if you're doing it right. Um, when you get into this, you know, one second and beyond, that's more like with the testing, that's where you the I.O. ground. You're, you're trying to do probably input and output, or uh, something's usually going on that's beyond being CPU bound at that point. And then, of course, this one is just, this is ridiculous, but it's something to keep in mind because if you're running a bunch of unit tests, if we can provide feedback so that the user knows that, hey, it's actually doing something, it's not broken, and we can keep it under 10 seconds, then no, we're gonna stay in that flow and that state of mind that we're not, it's like, okay, big deal. I can wait up to 10 seconds for my unit test to run. That's gonna give me all this assurance that this fairly large growing program is still running really solid. And this was a chart that he had used 
member guy, and he was a, uh, you know, the specifics don't really matter too much here, but he was talking about a general uh, web application, maybe. You're trying to test that with like Selenium or some type of thing that drives the browser. It's opening an instance of the browser and doing stuff, and that requires all this stuff. It's your test, you know, the browser, then the browser's got the DOM, and then, you know, some JavaScript framework under it, and then that's got to go across some network I.O., and then that ends up at a relational database that's got its own I.O. and issues and stuff like that. So you can easily end up taking over a second to do all of this. And that's why, of course, a lot of web pages are slow, too, because you have this huge stack. Um, but regardless of whether or not we like that, that's what a lot of enterprise scenarios, they, for one reason or another, they prefer to use these giant stacks. So what do you do about that? How can you reduce that frustration? And the idea is, is you start pulling out the pieces, the especially I.O. bound pieces as much as you can. And over here is another little example that I cut out across his slides and he removed the, the browser you can see. And then you can see that this uh, HTTP over the networks removed. Um, you know, the backend database is now a in memory array or whatever. And uh, the only thing he's left here is his JavaScript framework, because I guess he was wanting to show how you could test that. And then you're down 10 milliseconds or something within the potentially acceptable range. But if you have a lot of tests, that can still add up. So you could even pull out this layer to test everything that doesn't specifically require this layer. You know that you could stub it out or, dare I say, mock. Not a fan of mocking at all. Um, all of the top voices Kent Beck, Martin Fowler, and I believe even Bob Martin, uh, rarely to mostly never do mocks. So that's something that they're the guys who in basically more or less invented the game and wrote the main books on it. But yeah, that's just to show you remove out. This is more of like a full integration. This is actually more of like a full user acceptance test. This is more like a basic integration test, and this is more. But of course, there, I think there's too many layers. I feel like, you know, just um, right below this layer, you would just do a stub that would short circuit. Just do the minimum possible. Otherwise, write up a little real thing or use a smaller different thing or whatever. Mocking to me is just like, mocking seems like a lot of work for nothing. I know there's some frameworks that kind of automate that, but I'm not big into frameworks, so... That's what the stub, you can just return true or just return that basic expected object with those basic expected properties filled in properly. Here was uh, another one of the slides from the Cucumber guy. And I sort of consolidated this one as well because normally if you're familiar with this uh, pyramid form, it usually says UI tests on top. You want very few of those and you have your integration tests, services tests, whatever you want to call them right here in the middle and you'd have a medium amount of those, and then of course a lot of unit tests. But one thing he pointed out, which I agree with, is that that's just that was like a baby step that pointed us towards the UI tests um, were typically slow because of things like Selenium or whatever. We got to fire up these big contraptions that wire everything together just like it would be in the real world, and then run a little test and then reset all those contraptions, fire it up maybe, and run another test. And uh, not only that, but writing those tests, they much tend to be much more complex tests to write as well. So those can be slow and expensive and all that kind of stuff. And uh, But really, he, he figured out what's really going on is it's not so much that UI tests are bad just because they're supposedly take so long to fire up. And with a lot of instances, people write brittle UI tests. It's really just about the speed at the end of the day. That's... That's what the bad thing was. So if you forget about this, that's why I have them crossed out right there, somewhat crossed out, is that uh, we don't want those tests that are taking tens of seconds, especially for an individual test. Um, we can manage a certain amount of tests that take more or less than a second. You know, So those will be the integration tests, most likely, that I.O. that can take a second to go over a network or fetch stuff from a busy disk spinning disk or whatever. Um, and then we, of course, are happy with lots of very fast tests, which tend to be unit tests. 
Um, but yeah, you know, that ultimately this is what we care about is that those tests, the tests we're running all the time, we want to finish very quickly and uh, push the rest out, make those tests run less frequently and be less reliant on them. They don't matter until we're finished adding our programmer level stuff here and lots and lots of little tests and then we push it out to uh, integration and then those tests can take a little bit to run. You know, ideally, we don't want those tests to take hours to run, but if they take more than 10 seconds, it's not a huge deal. Um, yeah. So here's an example from, I was watching some videos, I'll do this every so many years, probably every half a decade or something, I go, okay, there's a job opportunity or whatever where I just need to learn a framework. You know, they want a framework or whatever this job is, this framework's going to cut down the time it takes or whatever, and I've just got to suck it up, even though I'm one of those people who is just, you could just call me anti-framework. Because that 99% of the time, that would be the as far as like big third-party popular frameworks go. So I started watching some videos on Spring Boot, I believe, or Java, which is obviously framework these days at the time of this recording for Java stuff. And I thought, hey, I should give it a once over. I haven't done that in a few years. And whatever and see if there's some things I like about it you know so I went in with a totally open mind and as usual within the first few minutes I'm just like oh yeah that's right <laughs> I, this is why I don't like frameworks and this is why nobody really knows how to do test driven development right and all this stuff and I feel like maybe I can say that because I don't do a lot of testing so I still come from that like pure virgin perspective where I do a lot of studying about testing. And I, I do write, I've, I've written a lot of tests. At this point, I couldn't even count how many tests I've written. But overall, in the grand scheme of things, you know, compared to somebody who's testing day in and day out for years, I'm not one of those people. And I've always been able to build up my own frameworks from scratch. No big deal. You just write some additional classes or modules or whatever and give them test, da 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 you know, test bicycle and bicycle stuff like that and then you just have a little main method in there that calls the uh calls all the little tests in the me in the sub methods below it and those little tests call into that you know main bicycle class for example whatever just test that and it's that simple you don't need tons of annotations and things like that those are just not really necessary those can come in handy if you find yourself working on large enterprise software and you know maybe there's just a lot of boilerplate code, but I've just I've never found the need yet to even pull in a third party framework, for this kind of stuff. And I'm going to show some of, you know, this is I don't know if it was from Spring themselves, but these were definitely some pretty hardcore Spring advocates here. So if they weren't from Spring themselves, they were probably from some other major corporation that was using Spring. And they've at least rightfully called this an integration test. And I believe they were describing it under the guise of a unit test, but it's it's not a proper unit test. And in, in my opinion, it's not even really a proper integration test. But anyway, I'll kind of get to it. This is, uh, like I said, it's the Spring framework over Java. I, if you don't understand it, it looks kind of foreign. Don't worry. I don't under, I'm not, this is about the extent of my, I don't even know. I, I know this, this little test annotation probably just works for discovery so that when you run the test suite, um, the test runner, it's able to come in and find out that this is a test that needs to be run. This auto-wired annotation, I think, I don't know, it must bring in some stuff. But anyway, what they have here is they have this arrange, act, and assert. That's pretty common. So, and this is a test, of course. It's going to get car, and it's going to make sure that car returns car details, and it potentially throws an exception. So... Really, this uh, they weren't trying to be super real world with this, of course. And I and I really like their presentation overall for the most part. But this is just something that most people get wrong here. So they they don't do any arranging, which whatever they decided for one reason or another to skip that step. And then they have a response entity, which I guess consider like a response object from a 
an, an I.O. request, obviously, right? And it's a typed car that's expected. So this is kind of just some of the ugliness of the Java, that static typing. So it, just to, you can almost ignore that and just here's your variable response if you're more of like a JavaScript, Python kind of person. And then this REST template, they're actually, this was on the previous line. Dot means that they're calling this method here on this object, this REST template object. So on that REST template object, they're calling get for entity. And then uh, the IntelliJ IDE that they're using actually fills in this little thing because sort of blemishes in the Java language is that it's difficult to know what you're, uh, you're passing in here. You can't do like keyword assignment as easily quite as easily as like in Python or something, or a parameter assignment, I guess. So what they're doing is they're calling this URL, this address, obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, and they're passing it uh, the car class. So then that returns a car class type as a response entity called response. Sum all that up, I assume. And then we come down here and assert that everything's the way it should be, right? So if you read like this, assert assert that response dot get status code is equal to HTTP status OK. When I first read that, I was impressed because I'm really big, especially in object oriented programming, about each statement should read like a sentence. That's what object oriented programming, pure object oriented programming is truly about. And I started going through on the first round of analyzing this code, and I'm reading them, assert that response, get body dot get name to Prius. Okay, there's a smell. We got the getters in here. And if those weren't there, it would read even more like a sentence. Assert that response body name is equal to Prius, right? And I thought, oh, well, big deal. But then I'm glad I noticed that because then I'm like, hey, wait a minute. They're testing the internal state of this object. They're not supposed to do that. I mean, I can understand it's an integration test and whatever, there there might be some consideration to be made. But just like I said, I'm trying to focus towards unit testing. So I'm using this integration test a little bit more as an example of a bad unit test. So a lot more as an example of a bad unit test. So for one, getters and setters are bad. Um, you're not following proper object oriented design by using getters and setters. There should be little to no getters and setters in any of your code. Um, and then right here we have multiple assert statements. So the getters and setters are basically just testing state, which you don't really want to do. You want to try and test behavior more than state. Of course, if it's a returned object and you want to test, these should all be different tests if they're worried about each particular thing, because that would help narrow down, okay, it, it was just, uh, you know, the type of car that was wrong, or it was just the model that was wrong. Here, you don't know. I mean, you do, you'll know because it will fail out and blah, blah, blah. But in the long run, it really boils down to the fact that it's one assert per test. So there, the fact is there's three asserts here. It's asserting that HTTP status is okay. So that should be a different test, you know? Like, if HTTP status is okay, then we will get this response. So we know this test will work if there's a network connection. So we don't need to test the network connection and the returned object. See what I'm saying? That's, that's testing two separate things. And yeah, I mean, you could justify that it's simpler and quicker and all that kind of stuff, but it's just, in the long run, it is not the way to go. something else okay the other thing was this missing a range here so most ides aren't even going to fill in this url of what it is here so what i would have done is i would have said i would have just made a little quick temp variable right here in the arrange section and named it url for instance and then set it equal slash car slash prius and then i would have just passed in url and then that would have helped condense this to possibly fit on one line um, this is a little bit zoomed in, but and also it's Java, which tends to be pretty verbose. So whatever, but especially in other languages, that would definitely help reduce that. And in what, Java 11 or something like that, 
you can just type VAR here, I believe, instead, and just have response. So with the combination of those, reduce the the complexity of looking at the code. Just like that. So anyway, that's really all that stuff. That out of the way. Come in here and look at this program. So what this is right here, don't be scared. It's written in C, plain old C language. Um, but don't be scared if you don't, if you're just like a Java person or JavaScript or Python or whatever, don't be scared by this code because it doesn't matter the specific syntax so much as just what I'm going to, I'm just going to brush over it and describe the basic idea that applies to pretty much it. So what I have here is I just, this ugly looking mess is basically this, it's an output function. It's something to write output to a terminal or to a file or whatever, but because of the Windows API, this program is actually, it's the type program uh, for the console. So if you were to type like literally T-Y-P-E, if you type that word into the console, followed by one or more file names, it will dump the contents of those file names to the console. So you could, you know, if you had a little text file, make file or something for your programming, or even the source file, I could just literally type t the word type and followed by that file name and hit enter and dump the contents of that file to the console so I could read them, whatnot. So anyway, I tried to clone Microsoft's version without, you know, disassembling theirs or anything, but just based on behavior and the way I think it was likely written myself from scratch in the C language. So that's what this is. And if we take this output function, it's a define. So that means it's not a real function. Um, or a method like you might think, but it's close. But what it ends up doing is it goes through this source code and everywhere I have the word output, it pastes all this stuff in. And then whatever parameters I've passed to the word output, like right there's an output, right? So I passed it that parameter, then this string and that parameter and so on. It passes those parameters in here. And then when it goes in and does that effective cut and paste, it fills in all these with those parameter names and whatnot. So it acts a lot like a function. The difference is, is it, it all happens right before compile time instead of uh, being an actual function call. So it just saves me from having to type this out everywhere this appears, just like a function would. But because it cuts and pastes itself, it's more efficient, arguably. It's more uh, CPU efficient, maybe less space efficient so that was a trade-off because i wanted this program to run really really fast like a you know, in my opinion those little commands you run at the command line should run super fast do one thing so that's what's going on with that so like i said everywhere it's doing that it's just taking consideration because it has to see if it's a wired character and whatnot there's behavior from kicking around Microsoft's version and the way it reacts, this was sort of like what I had to do to get that same effect. So like I said, going down through here, you can see there's all those output calls and it just probably cut the code size almost half for the number of lines. And that being said, other than that pseudo function, if you want to call it that, uh, then we have that one real main function, which most programming languages have at least some entry point function, right? In the C language, as in many others, it's main. And we just have some plain old variable descriptions we're not going to worry about. And then we come down here and you can see I've, for above each block of code, I just sort of stuck a comment there that says what it is. Okay, no argument. So this is saying, hey, if they don't pass us a file name, then it's going to say the syntax of the command is correct. This is the Windows carriage return instead of just a new line. But anyway, uh, I could, this is one of the ways you sort of refactor code and decide what you want to put in a function. It's one of those simple methods, of course, you're probably familiar with it, is you just split everything up into logical blocks of code and then slap a comment on top of it. And then if you want to, if it's worth the effort to pull it out and stick it in its own function, then you could just name it like test for no arguments or no arguments or this isn't a test per se. So, I mean, it's obviously testing users input at runtime. So this is more of like a runtime test. Unit tests are like 
more of like more like a compile time test, even though technically they are run time tests, but they're not they don't run usually you run unit tests instead of a main function. That's what you do. So in the real world you're gonna run your program with that main entry point. When you're running unit tests, you're going to go into your test runner's main entry point and then sort of run everything in a random order instead of this more linear. Okay, so anyway, yeah, that that being said, all this stuff could get pushed out into different functions, right? I could name this one bogus switches, and then effectively, effectively, the main function would just become like a declarative type of a thing, and you know, instead of like a list of variables here, it would just be a list of function calls that all read in plain English. Uh, check arguments, check switch, check bogus switches process files, so on. But this is only, it's just under 100 lines of code as is. I want it to run fast. So, I mean, they do say get it working first then optimize later, you know. But anyway, I just, following with the KISS principle, which I consider the most important principle, whether you're writing a regular program or tests, keep it stupid simple, right? Keep it short and simple. So if I did, Anyway, let me just get to my little list I have here. If I were to push this stuff out into functions, or if there was a class, push them out into methods, right? Would that reduce duplicate code? Well, with the output thing, it did. So I did that, end of story. With all this other stuff, though, there's no, no duplication. It only happens once. So it's not, I mean, maybe some, but there, there's no significant reduction in code in there. Does it reduce the complexity of the code of just looking at the code? Well, as it is, it's less than 100 lines, like I said, and I've got a little comment right on top of everything, so it's pretty much self-evident what's going on, I think, fairly. And if I were to pull everything out, I would have that little block of declarative statements that says what's happening, but all of these would be potentially out of order, somewhere else in this file and the file length would grow longer and stuff like that so i you know it's it would technically add to the bloat of the file itself so i feel like that would increase the code complexity if this stuff wasn't self-evident then i feel like it would reduce it and then that would be justified if you think about the code as a single class or module would these be quote unquote private functions so do these functions, if I did push these out into functions, like is encoding ASCII or is ASCII, whatever I want to name that function, would I call these from another module or from the command line or anything? You know, would, would I specifically call them in any way, shape, or form? And my answer is no. I, I think they'd be pretty much private. They'd be effectively private functions. So... I could push them into private functions. I could justify that if I didn't have that confidence about what these are accomplishing. So say I came down here, you know, I, my thing is, is honestly, I can test, I've written tests. I'm just going to tell you ahead of time. I've written tests over here that test it at the command line. They test that output at the command line. Normally, especially in larger enterprise software, uh, microservices, things where you're talking about multiple components, not just a singular component like this, that would be a big no-no, you know. I mean, not that it's not okay to test the output at the command line, but with this, the way it's effectively doing one thing and ideally doing that one thing well and only that one thing, it's sort of like a function at the command line in and of itself. So this main function just becomes type, you know, and then instead of wrapping your parameters in parentheses, like in a lot of languages, you just put spaces in between them on the command line. So this is basically a singular function on its own in, in that regard. So that being said, like that would be the one public thing, that, that main, that's the one public thing. So that needs to be tested some way, shape or form because that's public. So that's for sure needs to be tested, whether that's integration, user level, whatever you want to call it. Um, the way I'm going to show you is very similar to, it's not technically a unit test, but it's effectively a unit test.
other than the fact that it violates some things. But like I said, for this one, basically this one condition where you have a singular module at the command line, this is like the one exception where you have something that does a little bit of I.O. everything. And probably get away with still calling it a test. So otherwise, this is it's fast um, and effective testing. Excuse me. What I've written down here is, is fast and effective testing possible as is? So that's the thing. And I say yes. Like even with all this I.O. stuff going on here, um, th this thing can test itself in a split second, one second or less. So, And it doesn't need a whole battery of tests because it's just this one mod. But anyway, I could, you know, I could have made main call something else. I could have pushed all this functionality into a function called type. And then I could have made main just call type. And then I could effectively test type from within just the code. If I really was that worried about, you know, not wanting to write a batch file at the command line and stick in the purity of being a unit test. So that's kind of like would have been the next best option here. Or maybe even the best option. So what I do is I have these tests. It's testing if there's no arguments. It's testing the help switch. It's basically it's testing the interface, just like a good unit test should do. But technically speaking, this is an integration test because it is, even though it's not integrating with anything else, it is running I/O going on here. I'm testing the I/O. So that is that fine line right there between unit testing and integration testing. Right, so right here I have the uh, an example of hello world, of course. This also written in C, just a singular main function. Let's say I was writing a book about the basics of C programming or something, and I was going to use this code in here. I've already compiled it. Uh, I better not have introduced any typos or anything since then. It seemed to compile well, and it printed hello world to the console and exited with zero errors and everything. So is this program, does it need unit testing, you know? And I'm I'm not just saying that as, like, just a dumb question. I mean it on a level of, like, if this were representative of a program at scale, would this need unit testing? And as is, I think, yeah, it needs, you know, some type of testing, like I said before, right here. It either needs, like, a, a little batch file that just tests, like a command shell script that just tests and checks whether or not hello world was printed to the console. And if so, good, done. End of the day, that test ran in a split second, right? So that could work. Or, as I mentioned before, I could push all this into a secondary function and you know or this line anyway and i could call it like display message or something and call display message here and then have display message somewhere else and it would actually have the the meat of what's going on there and then i could make a test file that's not a batch file that's another c program file and i could call into this module and just test that one little function in isolation or i could even put the test within this uh same module itself if I really wanted to. So anyway, those are some options, right? So let's say I'd done one of those things and I had my test and I'm good. Cool, that's it, right? That's one and done kind of a thing. So then if you consider like that refactor wheel, like is that enough? Am I one and done? Can I walk away from this? And if I don't expect this code to change, if I don't have any reasonable expectation of this code to change in the foreseeable future then why should i change it you know um but if we consider ourselves or our client or the customer whoever that may be you know somebody who has input into the functionality of this program what if they want it to say hello world in multiple or something like that then we would have a reason to potentially very likely change in the near or distant future or whatever. So in that case, for now, we're fine. We we shouldn't do anything in that case. We shouldn't 
do that until we get there. We'll cross that hurdle when we get there. So when we did get there, we could push this puts thing out into another function or have it call, you know, there would be some functionality added to extend this to make it pull in different strings based on the uh, language, their language symbol passed into it or detected at runtime or whatever. Um, and that would warrant more testing. But as is, we don't need to do any refactoring on this until we get to that point. And at that point, we would refactor, of course, and do that. And then we could potentially split up the display. Like what if we wanted it to display in a message box in addition to the console because now we want it to run in a graphical user interface. Of course, speaking as if it was representative of a larger example again. Those are all reasons to refactor and to add tests and to do all those types of things when you get to those points. And of course, like I said before, ideally you would write the test first. So that helps you decide like, do I need to refactor and write the test yet? Nope, not if it's not. So if you get to something and you think like, this isn't testable for whatever reason, then it's probably doing too much. So even if you think about Hello World right here and think like, this isn't testable, for example, right? Just like I said, then it needs refactoring, you know, or it needs, you're looking at it wrong of what you're testing or something. But in most situations, if somebody thinks something isn't testable, it seems to me from my experience that they're just gunking a whole bunch of different types of functionality together instead of that do one thing and do one thing well, single responsibility kind of stuff. So consider breaking up those responsibilities. IO, input and output is a responsibility, whether that's to a console or to a file, over a network, any of that kind of stuff. You want to avoid IO, except as noted previously with like, you know, it's this simple test, but even then, Really, ideally, you want to avoid I.O. So this put statement is an I.O. statement. So that should go into its own layer. All of those things we've talked about on this confidence thing. That was way too long of a delay right there from when I clicked, for example. So all of this stuff that's talked about right here, these are all separate layers. That user interface layer, that's, that's what this would be right here, right? This put statement, that would be a user interface layer which is different than, I, I guess it has overlap with business logic in this circumstance, but that's a different layer. It's different than security, whether or not somebody should be able to run this program. We're not worried about who's running this program from within itself. Some programs you might be, um, but some might rely on the operating system's permissions only, or in addition to, however. And of course, that would be an integration test in that circumstance because you'd be bringing in the responsibilities of another system to test with your program. So that would not be as per se. And no mocks. Mocks turn into I.O. That's why I say lean towards the stub, that little short circuit on the end that's going to do the minimum amount possible to cap off that I.O., give that minimum expected result, just enough for you to test your thing that it's otherwise doing everything it should, uh, that, you know, you're testing your expectations of how your thing should work. Then later in the day, when you push that out to an integration testing thing, continuous integration server, that thing can test whether or not your thing truly works with MySQL or some other external entity or not. Start with the primary pass through the code, then test for the edge cases. So that basically means test the obvious stuff, you know, if you're testing a calculator, test that one plus one works. Then the edge cases is, then test if negative 0.01 works. You know, start with the, get all that obvious stuff out of the way because that's usually the most important. Then start working towards those edge cases of like, what if I type in text, what's it gonna do? Maybe I made a hex calculator that takes A, B, C, D, E, F, right? Well, what happens if I type in G? Does it even let me type it in? Does it, you know, or if I just pass the, um, let's say that speaking on more of that unit test level, I was getting a little bit more user test, obviously, but speaking on the unit test level, if I just take that like add function that say it takes hexadecimal letters and I pass it a G, what's it going to do? You know, is that going to fit my expectation? Do I expect it to throw an error? 
Do I expect it to just change that G into something else? Whatever, whatever your, there are infinite possibilities, right? So you just want to make sure whatever you expect it to do, that's the effect that happens, whether it throws an exception or it returns a null or whatever. And what you do once you get to those edge cases where you start testing those things, you only write enough of those kind of tests until that fear turns in, that quote unquote fear turns into boredom. So once you feel like, whoa, you know what, I could be here all day writing all this stuff, then just stop. You know, if you're just writing tests to write tests, don't do it because even though we want to be fairly liberal with how many tests we write, there it's that happy medium to where we want to write a lot of tests, but we don't want to just write tests to write tests. You know, we want each test to matter. So once something matters, once you need something to fulfill, to help you feel confident, write a test for that. Anything that you test by hand more than one or two times is probably a good candidate, an automatic test. So what we're doing is we're closing the gap on expectation versus reality. So what we expect versus what happens, what scenario, that's what we're doing. It's all to provide us with confidence. It's not a black and white thing. It's a, you know, a percentage scale. So we'll never be 100% confident, but we want to approach that. We're, we're leaning towards that. And I had mentioned this before, but I wrote it down, so I want to mention it one more time, is that TDD is test-driven development, writing your tests first, shows us that tests can actually fail, which is very important because we, if the test doesn't fail, then it's no good in, in a failure scenario. So speaking, uh, just kind of touching on this, especially for TDD test first with unit test, this helps us to avoid the YAGNI, you ain't gonna need it acronym, which a lot of people, that's that whole thing of like, oh, should I do this? Should I refactor that out into that and make this a separate module, whatever. Just if you write that test first, that failing test first, and just write just enough code to get it to pass and stick to that cycle, that test uh, red, green refactor cycle, you're probably gonna write just enough code and you're not gonna have a tendency to write too much. And the cool thing with using that cycle is that it helps you, it you're sort of leapfrogging. You're doing a couple steps at a time. Whereas if you just really work in baby steps, you'll find yourself even refactoring more if you do it properly by writing a monolith. This is a monolith right here, this main program. It might not seem like it, but this is a monolithic program. Like I mentioned before, you've got your IO right there and that IO should not be, and then you've got a string hard coded right there. You know, So there's, there's violations that if, this would not make a good, um, you know, this is technically, this is data, right? So this data could be variable from a database, blah, blah, blah. So if you think of this at scale in a larger program, a more real world program, you wouldn't want your data hard coded. This might very well be uh, multiple languages in the future and stuff like that. And maybe you'll want to write your output to a graphical system or a console. And even if you're already writing to a graphical system, maybe you want to write to a mobile instead of just the desktop and so on and so forth. So there's all sorts of things with that. So this is monolithic. You would have to pull each one of those layers out into their own sort of unit to make it not monolithic. It's easier to track down bugs when you do test-driven development and unit testing in general because, and especially with that singular assert statement is because you know that one thing, if that one test fails, maybe it will cause other tests to fail as well. But you know, that that test failing, they're all going to point to just one singular area. So that's going to minimize the amount of searching and tracking down the bug you need to fix. Which uh, it also makes your programs to easier to refactor because if I did write that test that makes sure that, you know, that external test like I'd mentioned before, that I'd done right up there with the other program. If I wrote that, tested for this hello world string, and then I'm like, you know what, I do want to, factor this out into a function. Uh, being representative of bigger code, this would be like a page or two of code maybe, right? And I want to refactor that out into its own thing. Well, by having that test outside of this function, I can do that. And then when I turn around and rerun the tests, ideally automatically within maybe 
some script or integrated development environment, then uh, it will it will go red. It will say, hey, test failed if I did something that screwed up that code. And that's called a regression. If something that was working stops working, that's called a regression. So anyway, that makes it easier to refactor because then it's like, oops, oh, I forgot to put a closing quote or I misspelled world when I cut and pasted it. I thought, you know, whatever. Uh, they're faster in the long run. It might seem like writing tests first and doing the test-driven development and unit testing, edge cases and all that might seem slow now, but if you consider that debugging, roughly speaking, number out of the air, people often say is like 80% of the time is debugging, right? So you're going to reduce that 80%. Um, so don't worry about how it's affecting the 20%. It's it's going to really chop down on that 80% time in, in the long run. And it, you're just going to have all that protection against those regressions and things. So it just really pans out in the long run. Resulting program is more robust, robust, of course, because everything's tested. There's a lot less chance for programmer errors. It prevents regressions, like I mentioned. Um, add regression tests. So whenever you do find, like if somebody reports a bug to you or you find a bug on your own, some bug from the wild, right? Then what you should do is write a test that that finds that bug that you did not find with unit testing on your own initially when the program was written. Write a bug that catches, or excuse me, write a test that catches that bug. And then leave that test in your test suite so that it always runs. So that if hello world spelt wrong or whatever test it happens to be, um, that if that ever changes for any reason in the future, that test will immediately find it. So say there was something goofy, you know, like maybe I put, uh, I, this is a really bad generic example, but maybe I had that in there. And for some reason that new line character was like critical to this program operating properly or use your imagination, make it up, make this representative of some bigger, more complex program. But something really trivial seeming like that was there. And then somebody comes in and they're just like reviewing the code and, oh, this is a put statement. This automatically adds a new line. What a waste. I'm going to get rid of that, right? So they do something like that. And then it seems like to the regular user, nothing happened, right? That could create this edge case regression type of scenario or something. But if you had a test because that new line was so critical for whatever reason, then it would find that. It would find that that person trying to be follow the so-called Boy Scout rule that Bob Martin uh, preaches about test-driven development, which I don't agree with, and that it just doesn't fit into real-world development anymore. Maybe back in the day when people were looser with their development, but being the Boy Scout should be its own commit, right? As far as speaking of like uh, a repository and everything, that if you're going to go in and clean up the spacing or something in the code, that should be a one-off thing. That should not be... I shouldn't be adjusting spacing and doing something else, you know? So anyway, on that level, be careful if you try and follow that Boy Scout rule. It can lead to a lot of problems. I know I've gotten told off online back in my more early days of trying to make contributions to open source projects and whatnot about that kind of a thing. But anyway, that's regression testing. Put that test in there. You're safe from anybody tinkering with, especially with trivial stuff that that otherwise wouldn't get caught. So I think that covers it. Thanks a lot.